Thank you for joining us today on ECFAL. Welcome to the program. I'm Ayola Kasim. The global economy increased almost five-fold in the past 50 years, but that growth was at a massive cost to the environment. Nature's resources still do not figure in countries' calculations of wealth. The current system is weighted towards destruction, as per se, not preservation. The bottom line, the United Nations says, is that we need to transform how we view and value nature, and we must reflect nature's true value in all our policies, plans, and economic systems. Well, with this work, we'll find out today on NetFile. Do stay with us. Bees are increasingly under threat from human activities, and yet, Pollination is a fundamental process for the survival of the world's ecosystems. Nearly 90% of the world's wild flowering plant species depend wholly or partially on animal pollination, along with more than 75% of the world's food crops and 35% of global agricultural land. Pollinators both contribute directly to food security and play a crucial role in conserving biodiversity. The goal is to strengthen measures aimed at protecting bees and other pollinators, which would significantly contribute to solving problems related to the global food supply and eliminate hunger in developing countries. Pollination by bees provides us with food products which we consume. Economists concerned well, the state of the environment suggests that it needs to be protected in the long term in order for our economies to survive, but more importantly, to secure the well-being of future generations. Services that bees and indeed nature provide is what economists say must be accounted for, and they advocate for natural capital accounting. Natural capital accounting is a process of measuring the economic value of nature's essential ecosystem services on which all human life depends. Examples include the food we eat, the water we drink, plant materials for fuel, medicines and building materials. It also includes less visible ecosystem services which has been referred to as intangibles such as natural flood defences, air filtration from forests, carbon storage from peat bogs, pollination of crops by bees, and habitats for wildlife. What we're talking about here is assigning a value to the services that nature provides to us, the ecosystem services. For example, a healthy forest that helps us to purify water, managing the whole hydrological cycle. All of us benefit from that service, although none of us may own the forest. And that is, I think, one of the key points, is that throughout the, the last 80 years, we have come, become accustomed to a system where we only measure something if there is a market price, and there can only be a market price if somebody owns something and can sell it to somebody else who wants to purchase it. But we are not talking here about assigning a market price to nature so that it can be bought and sold. That is far from what we are considering here. What we want to do is assign a value to it, a value that reflects the benefits that we draw from nature, so that when we conduct ourselves, we do economic activities, we take into account whether those activities have a positive or a negative effect on those benefits that we draw from nature. Nature and the ecological services it provides are free. We don't pay for fresh air, water, soil, or even the oil, gas, and other minerals below ground. What we pay for is the extraction, processing, production, and distribution of food, fuel, and materials that ecological services provide. Not forgetting the profit of those who exploit those services on our behalf. We also pay for pollution and waste and other inefficiencies that our own systems and services generate. Experts say what is amazing about nature is that if left to its own devices, those free ecological services are also renewable unless we use them up faster than nature can replace them, which is what is happening now. According to Global Footprint Network, humanity is currently using nature 1.7 times faster than ecosystems can regenerate. 
we're assigning a value to it as if it were if it were something to be exchanged, we would be thinking about what the value would be. But I want to stress here beyond any doubt, there is absolutely no intent here to start making a market of nature. What we want is for us to be able on the same basis of comparison to see that when we do certain things for legitimate economic reasons, we, we may be having an effect on nature that is not as strongly positive as the economic effect of that activity. And if we can take that into account, then we realize that what looked to be an optimal economic activity before actually is way suboptimal because it's generating all these losses of benefits and costs that we will have to confront sometime in the future at much greater cost than if we prevent the losses and damage from happening now. We now will understand the scope of the damage we're doing and we can act in a considerate and rational way to reduce that damage. That is the point behind this. I warmly welcome you all to the first informal virtual meeting of the 52nd session of the Statistical Commission. The United Nations pleasure, Statistical Commission at its 2021 session adopts a new Frank. system of accounting system that links both economic and environment and data. This ushers in a new era in how we measure prosperity and well-being one that goes beyond the gross domestic product and makes the contributions of nature central to economic planning and decision-making. The sixth meeting of the 46th session of the Statistical Commission is called to order. Established in 1947, the Statistical Commission is the United Nations' highest decision-making body for international statistical activities. The Commission generally meets for a four-day session in March every year, with participation of chief statisticians from United Nations member states, experts, policymakers, and the civil society. After World War II, we developed a system of national accounts and the gross domestic product, GDP, to measure the economic recovery. We had the massive economic stimulus of the Marshall Plan to pull us back from the brink. Since then, we have always measured economic progress in terms of the goods and services we produce and consume. That is the gross domestic product, or GDP. But we never did that for nature. And yet, nature provides services that we value, that we need, that we cannot exist without. And we need to account for that value, those benefits in measuring our progress. This time, after this crisis, the system is different. Our planet is broken unlike after World War II. We need a transformation in economic thinking. The economy needs a bailout after COVID-19, but so too does nature, because we are on the very brink of climate and, biolo and biological biodiversity disasters. We can no longer rely on GDP alone. It has considered the contribution of nature to be free and essentially limitless throughout its history. This new framework will put nature on the map. And as a result, just like Lee, we would never willingly and consciously do something to damage our GDP, so hopefully soon, we will begin to think the same way about nature. We will be able to measure and value the benefits and services we gain from nature. And we all know that what we measure, we value, and what we value, we manage. The link between natural capital and intangible ecosystem services is an important one. In forestry, for example, timber can easily be measured in terms of its market value, but intangible assets such as forest carbon sequestration, water attenuation, habitat and recreation amenity are less understood and often overlooked in terms of added economic value. The adoption of the new accounting framework called the System of Environmental Economic Accounting, Ecosystem Accounting, would mark a major step forward to incorporating sustainable development in economic planning and policy decision making and could have a significant impact on efforts to address critical environmental emergencies, including climate change and biodiversity loss. The SDGs are an integrated framework which, thus far, have lacked an integrated measurement system. Protecting and conserving biodiversity cannot be done without looking at the economic drivers of that biodiversity loss and environmental degradation. 
Now more than ever, as we stand literally on the very brink of a natural catastrophe, the loss of, of biodiversity and climate change, we need to take a much more holistic approach, taking nature into consideration whenever we make economic decisions. We have long understood and accepted that we can no longer rely solely on GDP. With this new framework, we've taken the first decisive step to no longer having to. With financial capital, when we spend too much, we run up debt, which if left unchecked can eventually result in bankruptcy. With natural capital, when we draw down too much stock from our natural environment, we also run up a debt, which needs to be paid back. For example, by replanting clear-cut forests or allowing aquifers to replenish themselves after we have abstracted water. If we keep drawing down stocks of natural capital without allowing or encouraging nature to recover, we run the risk of local, regional or even global ecosystem collapse. Poorly managed natural capital therefore becomes not only an ecological liability, but a social and economic liability too. Working against nature by over-exploiting natural capital can be catastrophic, not just in terms of biodiversity loss, but also catastrophic for humans as ecosystem productivity and resilience decline over time and some regions become more prone to extreme events such as floods and droughts. Ultimately, this makes it more difficult for human communities to sustain themselves particularly in already stressed ecosystems, potentially leading to starvation, conflict over resource scarcity, and displacement of populations. We don't have the consciousness that by doing that, in, in the long run, we lead to protecting our lives. We don't relate environment to protection of life. Of course, the Sierra Leone knows better now, okay? And Nigeria needs to learn from that so that we don't see the consequences before we start taking action. Ultimately, nature is priceless. However, it is not valueless. And there have been many studies that have calculated natural capital's value in financial terms. For example, street trees in California provide over $1 billion per year in ecosystem services through atmospheric regulation and flood prevention. And Mexico's mangrove forests provide an annual $70 billion to the economy through storm protection, fisheries support, and ecotourism. We need to make a business case for the protection of the environment. i give you a good, another good example. Nobody has looked at this. You have manufacturing plants in Ibadan, for example, that manufacture drinks. They are not one, there are so many. How did they get the fresh water that comes to them? That must have been coming from a particular community, a forest, or somewhere. Okay? Now, if we are able to identify that, we can find that out through vital science. It's scientific. So if community A is providing 20 or 30 percent of the fresh water, because we take it for granted that when we dig for oil, there is fresh water. We are just taking it for granted. That fresh water is coming from somewhere. Okay? And that is conservation. So if we get a community to say, okay, you need to protect the source of your fresh water, and if you just add like half a cobble, on your dreams that goes to that community to preserve conservation. They will protect the environment with their life in exchange. Because the point is that if that water sees, if the, if, if the natural environment is you know, kind of destroyed, they will find alternative way of get, getting water and that will be costly. The business case being put to the private sector is that it is in their interests to use their natural capital assets sustainably in the short term as a way to guarantee long-term profits. By depleting natural capital now, they put their supply chains and future productivity at risk. The ecosystem service value of tropical forests is estimated at $6,120 per hectare per year, while the cost of losing forests at the current pace amounts to $2.5 trillion per year if all ecosystem services were accounted for. Despite this clear macroeconomic case, the total yearly forest loss averages about 30 million hectares per year, representing the surface of one football field of forest being destroyed every three seconds. This continued loss and degradation of forests represents a massive market and policy failure.
The first United Kingdom National Ecosystem Assessment, published in 2011, showed, for example, that is £6,600 which United Kingdom farmers generate each year could not be produced without the help of ecosystem services such as water purification and regulation and soil fertility processes. The total value of pollination services alone is estimated at £430 million a year. The report concluded that ecosystems and ecosystem services and the ways people benefit from them are consistently undervalued in conventional economic analysis and decision-making. In a follow-up report published in 2014, the National Ecosystem Assessment focuses on how ecosystem services derived from natural capital support the economic performance of the nation. Natural capital accounting, the report concludes, is a fundamental activity that needs to be mainstreamed in economic decision-making. A report also commissioned by the United Kingdom Treasury found that countries currently spend $4 trillion to $6 trillion a year on subsidies that damage nature, often unaware of the long-term loss of natural assets. It found that the global capital produced per person had doubled in the past three decades, while the stock of natural capital or services provided by nature to each individual has dropped by 40%. In other words, people are becoming more productive only by significantly depleting our environment. The system of environmental and economic accounts, the ecosystem accounting framework, which is what we're talking about here today, has seen statisticians building on the expertise and experience of many communities in developing the framework, which can be used to complement GDP and to go beyond it. The SEEA ecosystem accounting is coherent with the system of national accounts. It accounts for and it assesses the value of the services that are provided by ecosystems, services which are essential for our well-being as humans. Nature and the contribution of these ecosystems to our prosperity and well-being will finally be reflected in our balance sheets. As an example, if we cut down thousands of hectares of forest for wood, our GDP will go up through the sale of the timber, the services that the timber provide. But we know that that's not the whole story. We will be losing all of the ecosystem services that that forest would be providing. Using the SIA and Eco Ecosystems Accounting, we can add to this understanding that there is also the degradation of the ecosystems and a diminished value to these vital assets. This ecosystem accounting framework is a game changer for the sustainable development goals. If managed well, natural capital is a long-term asset. It does not depreciate and can represent a cost-effective way of achieving multiple development goals, such as food and water security, climate change mitigation and adaptation. If you cannot put a number on the natural resources on which your economy depends, surely how can you monitor it? If you cannot monitor it, how can you add value? If you cannot add value, how can you ensure, how can you link it to sustainability? Meaning, you are going to keep this stock for the benefit of the present generation to the future generations. If you don't have the number, that question cannot be answered. There is no way you can add value on something whose value you don't even know right from the beginning. Absolutely. There is no choice. We have to do something. The recurring question is, why should this be critically important to all of us? The reality is that understanding overall stocks of natural capital and monitoring stock changes is vital at a national level. This understanding informs policy interventions and highlights whether countries are really creating new wealth and well-being or simply converting one form of capital, which is natural, into another. We might have a tsunami that comes in and destroys our city, but we can put a price on that because we have a price for what it costs to build the city in the first place. But that tsunami would also destroy some of the natural habitat around us, the cleanness of the rivers. It might strip away some of the vegetation on the mountainside. And because we understand for the first time the types of services that we are getting from having a, a healthy environment around us, for the first time we'll be able to appreciate and to assess how much we would lose if for some reason 
tsunami or otherwise, we lose those services that are being provided right now that we don't even take into explicit account. You know? Now, that is not to say that there's a price tag that we're assessing to it, but we will be able to understand what types of services are being lost, and we will be able to put a value to that so that when we look at what our overall uh, product is in our society, we can see that as a result of this natural um, catastrophe, we are less well off today than we were before the catastrophe, and the basis for our future prosperity has also been damaged. We will be able to assess that. And that is most important when we're thinking not about the natural disasters that we may not be able to anticipate or prevent, but when we think about all of our human activity that we know is causing a problem. Africa alone could save as much as $103 billion every year by harnessing its natural capital in a sustainable way. Money that could then be pumped back into alleviating poverty, providing access to clean energy and improving education and health. A significant share of these precious resources is lost through illegal activities. In addition, Sub-Saharan Africa currently spends $35 billion every year on food imports, a vast amount when you consider that only 3.5 million hectares out of a possible 240 million hectares of land suitable for wetland rice cultivation have been exploited. For instance, Africa loses an estimated $195 billion annually of its natural capital through illicit financial flows, illegal logging, illegal trade in wildlife, unregulated fishing, illegal mining, environmental degradation and loss. These activities continue to happen in the continent despite the efforts taken to address them. What will happen when it is adopted is that we will have an agreed framework around which countries will make their changes in the way, in the data that they compile and collect, and the information that they integrate into the system of national accounts. It will allow us, as I say, to bring in for the first time a, a valuation of nature and make that a part of the calculation of the change in value that we measure through GDP. Because GDP is a flow concept. It's about the goods and services that we produce and consume in a given period of time. We will also now be able to measure changes in the stock of natural capital to a certain extent, and that then will feed into our calculation of the overall product of the site. Now, of course, it's not going to be entirely comprehensive from day one after adoption. Many countries will still have to gear up their statistical systems and national statistical offices to be able to collect the information that they will need. But with the adoption of this framework, we will know what information has to be collected in order to calculate the values, and we will know how those values will be brought into the system of national accounts. It also allows uh, countries, especially in the developing world, to understand where the gaps might be in their statistical apparatus so that they know what they have to improve or strengthen in order to be able to collect the information that they need to do this kind of accounting. So, yes, it will be a transition period, but what it will establish is that standard, that baseline, from which all countries then with a, simil a similar and, and, and not a similar, with a, a single methodology will be able to move ahead and come to valuations that can be compared across countries and over time. And that's, I think, a really, it's so important that it will actually change the way we think about the basis of our future prosperity. Companies and countries have been told to shift their financial decision-making toward preservation. The report recommends, for example, that countries be paid to save forests and oceans, while companies that overfish in non-territorial oceans should be charged for their exploitation. The message is simple. Recognize nature as an asset. Let's have a transformational change in the way we think, act, and measure economic success to nature by protecting and enhancing the prosperity of natural world while recognizing the role it plays in the world of economics. Well, that's our show for the week. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next week.